Hi, I'm Mike Aiken, and I'm here today with Professor Pete Kyle from the University of Maryland. Pete's in Australia at the invitation of the Centre for International Finance and Regulation, celebrating the anniversary of his path-breaking paper on the consequences of informed trading in marketplaces. So welcome, Pete. Oh, well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. I thought what we'd start by uh, just asking a few background questions, like well, who are the people behind your thinking? Well, the, the main person behind my thinking was my father. <laughs> he was uh, a cotton merchant uh, in the 1960s and 70s and 80s uh, who handled West Texas cotton for farmers. And he uh, was an active hedger in the markets and also an act act active innovator in market microstructure. He designed the world's first fully electronic market and even wow. patented the concept of an electronic futures contract. And this was uh, back in the 1980s when I was a student. So I was constantly talking to him about market microstructure and dinner table conversation. Um, so when I went to university as a graduate student and started studying economics, I was kind of carrying an interest in futures markets and agricultural economics with me, but it evolved into an interest in finance. Now, like anyone, well, at least me, I'd like to think that uh, my best work hasn't been done yet, but obviously that was a pretty important piece of work, evidenced by the fact you're here celebrating it, but would you call that your best piece of work, or, or are there other pieces of work you've done since, or that you're working on now, that potentially beat that? Well, I'm, I'm really uh, happy about the work I'm working on now. It, it's not published, but I'm working on uh, the concept of market microstructure and variance. And what it does, it describes how the quantities that large traders trade and the speed with which they trade them and the amount by, by which they move prices varies with the level of trading activity in the stock. And it's, it's actually a direct extension of my 85 paper, and I even view it in my own mind as being a kind of completing the, the research agenda that I've been thinking about for the last 30 years. Wow. Yeah, so it, cool. yeah, so it ex explains why when you get into a more active market, uh, transactions costs fall and order size increases. Obviously, in a, in a much more liquid market, you can trade bigger quantities with less price impact, but it, it develops a, p a formula for how the sizes increase and the, and the transactions cost decreases. And that, that formula involves some counterintuitive powers of one-third and uh, two-thirds. This project I'm working on with my colleague, Anna Obujayeva, who used to be at the University of Maryland, uh, you know, where I am, um, and a related project on smooth trading uh, with Yajun Wang, who is a, a junior colleague of mine at the University of Maryland. So there's plenty to come then from you? There's a whole bunch of stuff in the pipeline right now and I'm very excited about its potential usefulness. It, it actually is very practitioner oriented in the sense that if you are a, a quant fund or an active trader of stocks or potentially in the hope we hope bonds, foreign currencies and commodities and you need a model of transactions costs which many of these, these large traders need, this provides a very operational model that is not too different from what people actually use now, but connect some dots together that people who trade probably haven't connected yet. Okay, let's get to some new papers that you've been doing. And I read one recently that has a lot of hits on the SSRN. It's the work you've done on the CFTC with the flash crash. And there are two kind of interesting things in there. One, obviously, is the whole story that you come up with in terms of high-frequency trading and how that was a, it wasn't the cause, but it was basically, you know, going to, egg people on. I'd just like you to explain that a little bit to our viewers. And the other thing I thought was really interesting was the statement in there about access to data and data being taken away from you. So it'd be interesting to hear your comments on uh, that as well. Okay, uh, that's a, a very uh, interesting question. About a year before the flash crash, I went to the CFTC to try to, a new research project that uh, would have the purpose of uh, informing the CFTC and potentially the outside world of uh, something interesting about futures markets, which you know the CFTC regulates in the U.S. And Andre and I decided that working on high-frequency trading in the stock index futures market would be a good idea, even though nobody was particularly interested in it at the time. We, we thought that in the future it was one of those items that would get high up on the agenda and that eventually people would want to know about it. And so I was looking at data on trading in the market, and you could kind of identify the high-frequency traders by the way in which they trade. And we had been categorizing the traders and trying to understand how to analyze them for a year or so. Then the flash crash occurred. So as soon as the flash crash occurred, high-frequency trading went from being one of the least interesting topics at the CFTC to being the most interesting. And uh, they put more resources into it. And uh, very fortunately, I, I think for the, for the public and for the CFTC itself, 
since we had already been studying it, the CFTC was able to very quickly figure out what was going on on the day of, of the flash crash. And that's different from the SEC, which was trying to study what was going on in the market for stocks. Yeah. Um, the SEC doesn't have an audit trail, but the CFTC does have an audit trail that's pretty good uh, that they uh, obtained from the CME, you know, where the trades actually take place. And, and the result was the CFTC could, could paint a pretty accurate picture of what was going on in the flash crash. And, and that picture showed that high frequency traders participated in the market before the flash crash and during the flash crash in about a third of the trades, their participation rate didn't change that much. They didn't seem to change their strategies or the quantities that they traded that much other than to move uh, kind of proportionally with volume. And when the flash crash itself occurred, you know, Andre and his colleagues had identified a $4 billion large meta order that was executed over about a 20 minute period. That, 75 uh, minis, or 75,000 75, minis. mini contracts. It was a gigantic order, the largest quantity any individual account had transacted so far that year uh, in one day, much less than 20 minutes. So we compared that, that 75,000 uh, contract bet or order with the quantities that the high frequency traders would, would trade, but they would typically only go long or short uh, a few thousand contracts, maybe two or three thousand contracts, maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty million dollars. So when the, when the flash crash started and this, this large sell order started being executed, the high frequency traders essentially got run over. Mm -hmm. They stepped up there, they made markets, and the bids got hit, and the next thing you know, they, they were long uh, thousands of contracts and the market was moving against them. And what they were essentially trying to do was continue to engage in their normal trading strategies as the market moved against them. And that involved selling and buying and selling and buying. And so as the market um, moved down, the high frequency traders were selling as if they were trying to liquidate their inventories, but then it would move down again and they would buy some more. Um, until the flash crash almost had bottomed out. And right in the last few seconds of the last minute or so of the flash crash, the high frequency traders you know, were kind of looking for where bids were. And uh, there was a kind of a vacuum that was associated with active trading by high frequency trading. Uh, we, we called it the hot potato effect, where the, it was as if the high frequency traders were looking for where buying was and all they were finding were other high frequency traders. Um, so there was this uh, hot potato effect that lasted a very short period of time and is associated with the bottom of the flash crash. So I, I don't think high frequency traders caused the flash crash. I think it resulted from this 75,000 contract order. Yeah. Um, and, it, and in general, I don't think high frequency traders create volatility in the market. Instead, they're just there kind of, uh, you can think of them as a little bit of lubrication of trading, or you can think of them a little bit of sand in the gears, depending on how you view high frequency trading. But, but in the grand scheme of things, they're, they're not affecting the overall level of prices or the overall volatility of the market. Mm. So you also make that comment in the paper, though, about uh, not being able to provide as much information as you possibly otherwise could because the data was withdrawn for some reason? Uh, so that part was very interesting. I had this paper that uh, I worked on with Andre Kirilenko, but Andre also uh, worked on some other papers with some other co-authors. When, when you're working on these papers, you're dealing with confidential data, and you have uh, a legal obligation uh, and a, just a, pr a professional standard that says that you should protect the confidentiality of the data. Right. And we were doing that. But in some of the other papers Andre worked on, he was slicing and dicing the categories of traders rather narrowly. Um, and he particularly wrote a paper, and I think this paper might have um, bothered the CME a bit, where he calculated the uh, profits that high frequency traders made when they trade with, with different counterparties. The profits that they make were being documented as being quite small. And I thought it was very interesting that the tick size is about $12.50. So the losses of the retail investors were actually half the tick size, which is half the bid ask spread, which just means that the retail investors are giving up a half spread uh, when they trade. It's as if they weren't timing their trades very adroitly and they're just trading randomly, which I think is useful information. At any rate, the, uh, I think the CME, for some reason, didn't like that paper. And they wrote a letter that you could call kind of a nasty letter to complaining to the CFTC that that maybe the confidentiality of the data wasn't being protected. And so what the CFTC did is they withdrew a lot of the papers that were using confidential data to put them through a kind of legal review process, which took inordinately long, like a, a year or more than a year. 
And during that time, these papers were not being circulated. The paper that I had written, the early version of it was still being circulated, but we had a revised version, which had some additional tables in it that needed to be approved. So that revised version was kind of embargoed for um, quite a long time, you know, like a year, along with all these other papers. And it disrupted the lives of some people. It didn't disrupt my life, but it disrupted some of the PhD students who were going on the job market looking for a job, and all of a sudden the chapter in their dissertation, which was the showcase of their research the last few years, is suddenly unavailable for them to, to present, uh, that's, that was really disruptive to them. So it's a learning experience for these regulators to try and uh, it, it, interact with the it, it academics. Was, it was, and they, they actually it became sufficiently controversial that the Inspector General, the internal auditor of the CFTC, actually studied it to see whether the confidentiality of the data was being protected or there were other issues. And the issues they identified did not relate to the activities of a research economist. They said there were some glitches in the IT infrastructure and the documentation of who had access to data, but they couldn't find any examples of data being actually leaked improperly or identities of traders being leaked. Right. And they also pointed out that the CFTC has a legal mandate from Congress to inform the public about futures markets by engaging in research. And by embargoing these data, the CFTC was temporarily at least kind of abandoning their legal mandate. And so I think the situation now is reversing itself and the CFTC is going back into the business of encouraging research using uh, the data they have, some of which is confidential. Excellent. Okay, let's switch to another important topic uh, that's taking people's time these days, dark pools. I mean, obviously we've got uh, a lot of people love them, a lot of people hate them. Some people are talking about different features of dark pools. Well, uh, the concept of dark pool to a lot of people's minds just conjures up something bad because it's dark. They don't call them light pools. But dark pools essentially represent an effort to benefit from the liquidity that everyone else is providing the market while not letting them benefit from your own trading. So the idea behind a dark pool is that you match a buyer and a seller together in a manner that, when, well, that other people can't really observe so that that buyer and the seller potentially don't move the market as much as they otherwise would but uh, the buyers and sellers can benefit from the prices that they observe that result from other people's trades. So what I think about dark pools is that after that trade has been arranged in a dark pool, I think it's fine to have a dark pool where you arrange the trade, before you actually finalize the trade, it should be offered to the open market so that the dark pool should be obligated to get, let other people have a chance to displace the buyer or the seller out of their trade. So they got to provide the liquidity to the rest of the market. So there's some story that uh, obviously the concern is that if you suck liquidity away from the main market, because obviously they don't, the dark markets don't contribute to price discovery. Right. You reduce the liquidity in the marketplace, increase the ability to manipulate. What do you think about that sort of story? I, I don't know about whether it increases the, the ability to manipulate, because manipulate's a, a tough word to define, but I definitely think that the dark pools are kind of designed to suck liquidity out of the market. And that the advantage of having a market, there, there's a network externality that's associated with having a market. And part of that next network externality is that the trading other people do, it helps me understand where the market is and helps me in my business. So everyone should contribute uh, to price discovery by allowing themselves to face the risk of being picked off. <laughs> It, as well as benefit uh, from uh, the liquidity being provided by the market by picking off other people if they have a big trade to do. Of course, I can't let you go also without getting you to comment on the SEC tick pilot that's coming up. Do you think they've structured it right or is there other control groups they should have set up? Well, the, the, my understanding of it is that there's a kind of bizarre political and economic logic that lies behind it that they have to deal with. And, and that bizarre logic, I think, has to do mostly with the way NASDAQ used to work in the 1980s and, and 1990s. There's, a, there's kind of a nostalgia for that. And the way NASDAQ used to work is that the bid-ask spreads that NASDAQ quoted were quite high. And the customers had to pay these bid-ask spreads. Much of the order flow is internalized because it was a dealer market. Yeah. And that meant that these enormous bid-ask spreads were captured by the securities firms. And the securities firms would split these enormous bid-ask spreads with the salespeople. And so what the salespeople would have an incentive to do is to get retail investors to trade the stocks with the most enormous bid-ask spreads because that was the most profitable for the company they worked for. Wow. But what stocks are these? Well, the stocks with the low price stocks with the enormous bid-ask spreads are the small stocks that many people would describe as the backbone of the economy. 
And so I think the, the bizarre political logic behind it is that if you can go back to the old days with wide bid ask spreads. Some of that uh, money's going to be given back. And yeah, maybe. Passed around. Yeah, uh, small retail investors will be stimulated to go back into these stocks. And the fact that there's a lot more. More research is, going into IPOs, perhaps, or something like that. I've more, heard that story. More, more research going into tiny little stocks. So, so the CFTC steps into this. And the, the tick pilot is, is the idea that the tick size uh, perhaps should be much higher than a penny for the smaller stocks. Maybe it should be a nickel or a dime because they're intrinsically more illiquid. So what they've done, is, in my understanding, is, is sort stocks into different categories and then have different, different rules that would apply to the stocks that have been put into the different categories. And then you can try to let the stocks trade under different sets of rules for a period of time. And then after that period of time is passed, the, the uh, research people at the CFTC can analyze the patterns of liquidity in the various stocks and see if they can conclude anything. It does sound like the SEC's got a number of academics there now talking about treatment and control groups and so forth. They do. Market microstructure people at the SEC were pretty good people. They are trying to be as scientific as possible. And they're trying to do that for two reasons, I think. One reason is they really are scientists. You know, people like Amy Edwards have a, a very scientific spirit that they're bringing to this. But also, they, they don't want to be perceived as being political. The SEC is a very political place. And the research economists at the SEC have a recent history of being caught in a kind of a crossfire and suffering quite a bit. So I think that by being as scientific as possible and actually structuring it almost like a clinical trial and having control groups and so forth, it's a way to say, look, we don't have a political axe to grind here. We're just scientists and we're going to find out what the truth is and tell everybody what we've discovered as scientists. And I think it's the right way to do it. So what other market structure issues that uh, people should be looking at? A big issue for the future is what I would uh, broadly call anonymity. It's related to like what should the regulators know and what should the public know. Yeah. So right now the regulators at the CFTC don't have a really good audit trail. Yeah. And what a really good audit trail should allow you to do is reconstruct not only the uh, identity of the a customer behind every order, but also reconstruct the limit order book. And, and right now it's, it's quite difficult to even reconstruct who's buying and selling if, down at the customer level, unlike the futures markets where you can actually do that. And it's worth pointing out, I guess, something about Australia in this respect, because Australia's always had that ability. And when we joined our two exchanges together, when we set up competition here, we had one regulator who combined all the data together Yep. And you have to have a client identifier on every order, and you have to know whether the person's trading as principal or agent, that is the broker. So I think some of those things are, are quite innovative here and probably need to be brought into other marketplaces. So it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next six, 12 yeah, months. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think that um, you, you also have that in the futures markets in the U.S. And one of the features that lets you have that is in the future, the futures markets in the U.S. are, are kind of like monopolies over the products that they trade. Yeah. And as a monopoly over the products they trade, they're in a position to collect more data because they can kind of collect whatever data they want. Mm -hmm. And similarly, in Australia, the stock market has a tradition of being more centralized than in the US or Europe, where it's very fragmented now. If it's very fragmented, it's very difficult to put together a good audit trail. So it's the audit trail, which is providing information about the identities of traders to the regulators is, is very important. But along with it is the issue of what do you disclose to the public? Mm. So you, we have our 13F filings and our various disclosures, which are creeping along in different markets in different ways. You know, for example, currently life insurance companies dis are, are required to disclose all of the trades they do in bonds. And they do a large fraction of the bond trading volume, so there's a lot of new information that's coming available to researchers about the bond market. Uh, asset managers make disclosures on a periodic basis. Um, so this is a, a very interesting issue uh, going forward, and, and I think that there probably should be more disclosure rather than less of, of actually who's buying and selling what. Maybe not in real time, but with a sufficient lag so that a trader building a big inventory uh, has a chance to get, build that inventory before the disclosure takes place. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time today, uh, Pete, but thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you.